Hi, this is Tom from ZeroToFinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through deep vein thrombosis. And you can find written notes on this topic at ZeroToFinals.com slash DVT or in the vascular surgery section of the Zero to Finals surgery book. So let's jump straight in. Venous thromboembolism, or VTE, is a common and potentially fatal condition. This involves a blood clot, or a thrombus, developing in the circulation. This usually occurs secondary to stagnation of blood and hypercoagulable states, which is where the blood is prone to clotting. When a thrombus develops in the venous circulation, it's called a deep vein thrombosis, or a DVT. Once a thrombus has developed, it can travel, or embolize, from the deep veins through the right side of the heart and into the lungs, where it becomes lodged in the pulmonary arteries. This blocks blood flow to the areas of the lungs and is called a pulmonary embolism, or PE. If the patient has a hole in their heart, for example an atrial septal defect, the blood clot can pass through to the left side of the heart and into the systemic circulation. If it travels to the brain, it can cause a large stroke. Let's talk about the risk factors. There are several risk factors that can put a patient at higher risk of developing a DVT or a PE. In many of these situations, for example, surgery, we give patients prophylactic treatment to prevent a venous thromboembolism. These risk factors include immobility, recent surgery, long-haul travel, pregnancy, hormone therapy with estrogen, for example the combined oral contraceptive pill or hormone replacement therapy, malignancy or cancer, polycythemia, which is a raised red blood cell count, systemic lupus erythematosus, which is an inflammatory condition, and thrombophilia, which is where the patient is prone to developing blood clots. A Tom tip for you, in your exams, when a patient presents with features of a possible DVT or PE, ask about risk factors such as periods of immobility, surgery or long-haul flights in order to score extra points. Let's talk about thrombophilias. Thrombophilias are conditions that predispose patients to developing blood clots. There are a large number of these, including antiphospholipid syndrome, which is probably the one to remember, factor V Leiden, antithrombin deficiency, protein C or S deficiency, hyperhomocysteinemia, prothrombin gene variant, and activated protein C resistance. A Tom tip for you, if you remember one cause of recurrent venous thromboembolism, remember antiphospholipid syndrome. The common association with antiphospholipid syndrome that you may come across in exams is recurrent miscarriage. The diagnosis can be made with a blood test for antiphospholipid antibodies. Next let's talk about venous thromboembolism prophylaxis or VTE prophylaxis. Every patient admitted to hospital should be assessed for their risk of venous thromboembolism. If they're at an increased risk of VTE, they should receive prophylaxis unless it's contraindicated. Prophylaxis is usually with a low molecular weight heparin, such as anoxaparin. Contraindications include active bleeding or existing anticoagulation, such as warfarin or a DOAC. Anti-embolic compression stockings are also used unless they're contraindicated. The main contraindication for compression stockings is significant peripheral arterial disease. Let's talk about the presentation of a deep vein thrombosis. DVTs are almost always unilateral. Bilateral DVTs are rare and bilateral symptoms are more likely to be due to an alternative diagnosis, such as chronic venous insufficiency or heart failure. DVTs can present with calf or leg swelling, dilated superficial veins, tenderness to the deep calf, particularly over the site of the deep veins, edema or fluid collecting in the leg or ankle, 
and colour changes to the leg. To examine for leg swelling, measure the circumference of the calf 10 cm below the tibial tuberosity. More than a 3 cm difference between the calves is significant. If a patient is presenting with symptoms of a DVT, ask questions and examine with a suspicion of a potential pulmonary embolism as well. So it's worth asking about shortness of breath, palpitations and pleuritic chest pain. Next let's talk about the WELL score. The WELL score predicts the risk of a patient presenting with symptoms having a DVT or a PE. It includes risk factors such as recent surgery and clinical findings such as unilateral calf swelling of more than 3 cm than the other leg. You can use an online calculator to calculate the WELL score. Next let's talk about making the diagnosis. A D-dimer is a blood test for a DVT that is sensitive, meaning that 95% of patients who have a DVT will have a raised D-dimer, but not specific, meaning that many patients with a raised D-dimer will not have a DVT. This makes it helpful in excluding venous thromboembolism, where there is a low suspicion. It's almost always raised if there's a DVT, however other conditions can also cause a raised D-dimer, such as pneumonia, malignancy, heart failure, surgery and pregnancy. It's worth noting it's never worth doing a D-dimer when a patient is pregnant. A Doppler ultrasound scan of the leg is required to diagnose a deep vein thrombosis. The NICE guidelines recommend repeating negative ultrasound scans after 6 to 8 days if the patient has a positive D-dimer and the WELLS score suggests that a DVT is likely. This is because the first ultrasound scan may have been falsely negative. A pulmonary embolism can be diagnosed using a CT pulmonary angiogram or CTPA or a ventilation perfusion scan or a VQ scan. A CTPA is usually the preferred investigation unless the patient has significant kidney impairment or a contrast allergy. Let's talk about the initial management of a DVT. The initial management for a suspected or confirmed DVT or PE is with anticoagulation. In most patients, the NICE guidelines from 2020 recommend treatment dose of Pixaban or Rivaroxaban. This should be started immediately in patients where a DVT or a PE is suspected and there's a delay in getting the scan. So the treatment is started before the diagnosis can be confirmed on a scan. The treatment can then be stopped if the scan excludes a DVT or a PE. The NICE guidelines from 2020 recommend considering catheter-directed thrombolysis in patients with a symptomatic iliofemoral DVT and symptoms lasting less than 14 days. This involves inserting a catheter under x-ray guidance through the venous system and applying thrombolysis directly into the clot. Next let's talk about long-term anticoagulation. The options for longer-term anticoagulation in venous thromboembolism are a DOAC, warfarin or low molecular weight heparin. DOACs are oral anticoagulants that do not require monitoring. They were called novel oral anticoagulants, or NOACs, but this has been changed to direct-acting oral anticoagulants, or DOACs. Options are apixaban, rivaroxaban, adoxaban and dabigatran. They're suitable for most patients, including patients with cancer. Warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist. The target INR for warfarin is between 2 and 3 when treating DVTs and PEs. Warfarin is the first line in patients with antiphospholipid syndrome. Patients with antiphospholipid syndrome also require initial concurrent treatment with low molecular weight heparin. Low molecular weight heparin is the first line anticoagulant in pregnancy. Patients with a DVT or a PE should continue anticoagulation for three months if there's a clear reversible cause and then it's reviewed, beyond three months if there's an unclear cause 
where there's recurrent venous thromboembolism or there is an irreversible underlying cause such as thrombophilia and often this is six months in practice and for three to six months in active cancer and then review. Next let's talk about inferior vena cava filters. Inferior vena cava filters are devices inserted into the inferior vena cava. They're designed to filter the blood and catch any blood clots that are travelling from the vena system towards the heart and the lungs. They act as a sieve, allowing blood to flow through while stopping larger blood clots. These are used in unusual cases of patients with recurrent PEs or in patients that are unsuitable for anticoagulation. Finally, let's talk about investigating patients with an unprovoked venous thromboembolism. When a patient has their first episode of a venous thromboembolism without any clear underlying risk factors, we need to consider whether it's been triggered by cancer. The NICE guidelines from 2020 recommend reviewing the medical history, baseline blood results and a physical examination for evidence of cancer. The previous guidelines from 2012 recommended routinely considering investigations such as a chest x-ray and a CT of the abdomen and pelvis although this is no longer recommended, unless the history and examination findings warrant further investigations. In patients with an unprovoked DVT or PE that are not going to continue long-term anticoagulation, for example, they finish three to six months of treatment and they're due to stop, the NICE guidelines recommend considering testing for antiphospholipid syndrome, which involves checking the antiphospholipid antibodies, and considering testing for hereditary thrombophilias, but only if they have a first-degree relative who's also affected by a DVT or a PE. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked the video, left a comment or subscribe to the channel, thank you so much, it really helps. Zero to Finals is not just a YouTube channel, there's also a website with detailed notes, illustrations and questions, an Instagram account where new questions are posted every day to help you test your knowledge, books, flashcards, and much more. I also have a personal channel where I share my thoughts and tips on learning medicine, and you can find links to everything in the description of this video. See you next time.